Hello, my friends. So at the time of this recording, we are just one day away from Yom Kippur. Yom Kippur is the holiest day on the Jewish calendar when we are closest to God and the essence of our souls. Yom Kippur means Day of Atonement. As the verse states, For on this day He will forgive you, to purify you, that you may be cleansed from all your sins before God. So for nearly 26 hours, we afflict our souls. We abstain from food and drink, do not wash or apply lotions or creams, do not wear leather footwear, and abstain from material relations. Instead, we spend the day in synagogue praying for forgiveness. Although Yom Kippur is the most solemn day of the year, it is suffused with an undercurrent of joy. It is the joy of being immersed in the spirituality of the day and expresses the utmost confidence that God will accept our repentance, forgive our sins, and seal our verdict for a year of life, joy, health, and happiness. And I just wanted to share that about Yom Kippur, even though when you hear this, it may have passed. Moving on. Also, we are just a few days removed from the one-year anniversary of October 7th, which was the worst, most disgusting massacre of Jews since the Holocaust. So today and every day, we pray for the swift return of all the hostages and we mourn all of the lives lost over the last year. But let us spare a thought for what that darkest of days revealed about our own societies. What it told us not only about Hamas, the Jew killing machine that masquerades as a national liberation movement, but also about us, about how far we have strayed from the path of reason, about our betrayal of civilization, about our total moral decomposition. To my mind, there were two horrors on October 7th last year. There was the horror of what Hamas did, obviously. Then there was the horror of the West's response. The horror of the West's failure to stand up with the Jews against their persecutors. Israel's enemies have spent the past year trying to destroy it, as they have so many, many times before. But it is they who have gone to the dust with the regime in Tehran, the only thing that is, for the time being, still standing. Absent that terror regime, and not just Israel, but the whole Middle East has a bright future. Sometimes you do need to make war to make peace. Sometimes there is a price to pay for trying to finish the work of Adolf Hitler. So a war for the soul of our humanity now must be fought on two fronts. On the physical front of Israel's borders, where some of the most regressive movements on earth sponsored by the Islamic Republic of Iran openly lust and agitate for the destruction of the world's only Jewish nation. And on the intellectual front, here at home, in the academy, in politics, in hearts and minds, only a, a full-throated defense of the virtues and wonders of Western civilization might see off the moral derangement of our times and the Jew hatred it has nurtured. We owe it. We owe it immensely to the dead of October 7th to stand by Israel and repair our broken societies. Now, I want to share some powerful words from <clears throat> Elika Lebon who is from Iran and absolutely someone who is an expert in this area with some very real personal experience. You may have seen some of her videos or tweets on social media. I urge you to, to follow her and check her out as her expertise in this area is extremely, extremely helpful. And she, and she says this, stop misrepresenting terrorism as resistance when these are the same agents that are being resisted from their heinous brutality, which is beyond all comparison. They have never lied to you about the reasons for their attacks on Israel. They have been honest and told you that their intention is to remove Israel. Why? Because as they've honestly told you, their goals are pan 
Islamism, meaning there must be one contiguous Islamic regime, region under Sharia law and the existence of the Jewish state disrupts Islamic hegemony. By hiding behind the lie of protecting civilians while systematically brutalizing civilians, subjecting them to asymmetrical warfare, ignoring the mass slaughter of civilians by their counterparts, they've managed to leverage sympathy from the Western world. This sympathy either directly or indirectly empowers the terrorists to have that have desecrated my country, which is Iran, and the entire Middle East for decades for the purpose of imperialism, supremacy, and domination over indigenous populations. They do this without any condemnation and in the, in the fact with assistance by hiding behind the most obviously dishonest red herring of quote-unquote defending civilians. So you aren't supporting freedom movements, you're suffocating freedom movements. Some people still foolishly believe that groups like Hezbollah are resisting Israeli aggression in Lebanon. They don't understand that Hezbollah and the PLO are the cause of Israeli counter responses in Lebanon. This is the reverse causation fallacy, a logical fallacy that reverses cause and effect. The cause of unrest in this case is strikes from Hezbollah, PLO, the effect is counter-strikes from Israel. Under the reverse causation fallacy, the cause is deemed by strikes from Israel, which are described as happening for no reason at all, and the effect is described as the emergence of terrorist groups in resistance, the actual cause of the strikes. We can only see... We can only see the situation clearly when true cause and effect are brought into very sharp focus. It's simple. It's very simple. No terrorists, no jihadists equals peace between Lebanon and Israel. This is what we should be advocating for. We should all be advocating for this. And finally, anti-Semitism is not just a Jewish problem. It never has been. It is the gateway to bigotry. In the Middle East, anti-Semitism directly contributes to the oppression of Middle Eastern people. And here's how. Because of the world's anti-Israel bias, they're willing to support Nazi regimes against them. These Nazi regimes oppress their own people from Iran to Syria to Yemen and beyond. So by empowering these regimes, not only do they target Israelis, they also are empowered to dominate and oppress Middle Eastern people via the bootstraps of anti-Semitism. This is much like how the Nazi party achieved its unrivaled domination. It rose up on the bootstraps of anti-Semitism and subsequently became sufficiently empowered to begin their quest for regional domination. Tens of millions of civilians were ultimately killed in the war that ended the Nazi regime. So bigotry is never an isolated problem. Those who ignore history are doomed to repeat it. And so I'll end with a couple quotes. This one's from Barry Weiss. What began on October 7th is a war for civilization. We expected Hamas to try and kill Jews. We didn't expect Americans to celebrate when they did. And Nietzsche, his words capture this whole thing quite perfectly from this one quote. There is a point in the history of society when it becomes so pathologically soft and tender that among other things, it sides with those who harm it, criminals, and does this quite seriously and honestly. Thank you for tuning in. I'll see you guys next time. Cheers.